Just 10 minutes before midnight, Sean had called us and wished us Happy New Year. And then um, it was only 13 minutes later that um, this crash happened. She came to the ER. She basically uh, had not, no skull from the forehead back. Uh, her brains and her skull were actually on the trauma room floor. As he was putting me into the car, my parents had gotten there. So the first thing that they saw was, you know, their son getting pushed into a police car, you know, with the handcuffs behind his back. I ran off the road into a park and hit a concrete bench on the passenger side and a tree on my side. So as a final result, Nicole died instantly. Teens are more vulnerable for a few reasons. One being that the way that they assimilate alcohol is different than the adult, and it usually will take less alcohol to uh, cause impairment for someone who's younger. Sean was just like any other kid. He had a very good personality, he was very outgoing, wasn't afraid to talk to anybody. He was an honor roll student, and he had a very wide circle of friends. He was one of, the, and the kids tell us this, he was somebody who was liked by everybody and who liked everybody. He had a personality that really saw the good in everybody, and obviously so many saw the good, saw the good in Sean. He set numerous school records, still holds the mile record run June 1st, 2001, at a time of uh, 418, just an unheard of feat for a 16-year-old. That night, uh, I got off work. It was around, you know, just a normal day. Got off work around six, seven o'clock. A friend of mine came over. We went into um, the town right next to us. Uh, bought a 12 pack of beer. Yeah, the peer pressure is there all the time. And, and a lot of times, especially in my case, I never felt it. It was never directed at me. It was never someone that came up to me and said, oh, why aren't you drinking or why aren't you doing this? It's just more of an underlying thing where you, you know, you see, you see your friends doing it and you think that that's something you should be doing. I was a junior in college and um, I was studying art, so I was only 20. My roommate's 21st birthday was at midnight on the 13th, so Apparently, she called her old roommates, Susie and Nicole, and invited them to go down to the bar she worked at. The bartender, I guess, just since it was Sarah's birthday, didn't check our IDs. He served me, Sarah, and Nicole five shooters each called stoplights, which have three shots in each drink. If you drink any alcohol, it is not safe for you to put the keys in the ignition and drive the vehicle. At the time, I, I didn't think, you know, I didn't think I was drunk. Um, you know, I was at that point where I felt like I could do anything. The other part of it is their, uh, their lack of experience or less experience operating a motor vehicle. You put those two together and it's like a powder keg. Around 1.30 in the morning, I stumbled up the stairs to use the little girl's room and while well, attempting to return, fell completely down the stairs. The bartender stood inside the door, where apparently I fell flat on my face again. So here I've fallen twice. Here's what happens to the brain when alcohol is consumed in a binge drinking episode. Imagine a typical 21-year-old male weighing 160 pounds, drinking one and a half ounce shots of 80 proof alcohol, like tequila or rum or gin, once every 10 minutes. The first two shots bring his blood alcohol concentration to about 0.05%, approaching the legal limit for intoxication, which is 0.08%. The alcohol in his body is affecting multiple brain chemical systems at this point. His cerebral cortex, including the frontal lobes and the cerebellum, are impacted. He probably feels a sense of euphoria produced by increased activity of dopamine in the brain's reward system. He might start to feel off balance and his speech might even sound a little slurred at this level. By the third or fourth drink, the adverse effects on the cerebral cortex and cerebellum escalate with a significant increase in the activity of a brain chemical called gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA. GABA begins acting on these parts of the brain and compromises balance, coordination, concentration, and visual tracking, 
the ability of the eyes to follow a moving target. All of these things make it dangerous to drive and increase the odds of injuries and other consequences. By five or six strings, the cortex, the cerebellum, the limbic system, and lots of subcortical regions are now all adversely impacted. At this level of intoxication, blackouts can occur, probably because the hippocampus, the memory creation center of the brain, isn't functioning properly. As our subject continues drinking, the brain suffers even more. At some point, areas in the brainstem are suppressed, causing extreme sedation, loss of temperature regulation, and potentially loss of reflex actions like gagging. Breathing and heart rate become slower, the drinker may lose consciousness, and even go into a coma as the entire brain begins to shut down. The risk of death from alcohol poisoning is now very real, as is the risk of permanent brain damage. All the effects of alcohol um, are uh, dangerous in the setting of doing something like driving, um, and, or flying an airplane, or being a surgeon and operating on people. I mean, not many people would like their surgeon to be drinking and having a good time and taking all kinds of chances with their life. He and his two buddies had just watched the fireworks at the, in the village of Chatham on New Year's Eve and uh, jumped into a car of a schoolmate uh, for a short ride back uh, to a house where he would be spending the evening. And then I made it to my car. Sarah jumped in the back and then Nicole sat her front. So they got in my car, they got in the back. My friend Chris was sitting, sitting shotgun. Um, and I, you know, took off down the road. Alcohol affects your mind in a way that um, lets down your guard. So, for example, you would not think of driving uh, very, very fast when you're sober because you know the consequences. So, in reality, as you're drinking more, uh, internally you feel more confident. They'll decide, well, I'm going to drive and I'm going to go fast and it's going to feel like fun because you lose sight of the fact that this is a dangerous activity. And you feel as though you are actually uh, more aware and your reflexes are improved. And therefore you put yourself at risk and uh, other people at risk. It gave me that confidence that I would not have otherwise had had I been sober. Sean didn't think, obviously, that he was going to be in a crash. He thought that this was just a couple of miles. He thought that um, this was a, a safe thing to do. It was a 25 mile per hour limit. I was going about probably 70, 70 to 75 miles an hour. We were both driving up Main Street and in Richmond we were trying to make the lights. And as I got about a quarter mile down the road, I. For one reason or another, I, I turned around to talk to one of my friends in the back. You know, I quickly turned and turned back towards the road, and I realized that my car was veering off towards the right. And so I cut the wheel. Oh my God. 75 miles an hour, you cut the wheel hard, your car's gonna flip. I think we were going like maybe 50, 60, I don't know, really fast considering the speed limit was like. But before they'd gone not even a mile, um, their car slid off the road 270 feet, at 20 miles over the speed limit, crashing into a row of trees, and Sean was ejected. I ran off the road into a park and hit a concrete bench on the passenger side and a tree on my side. The car flipped over, skidded about 300 feet or so, and, uh, and hit a tree. And by this time, it was just, you know, a total chaos, you know, crash scene. Um, you know, fire engines, ambulance, um, you know, probably eight, ten police cars, just, you know, sirens, just, you know, utter chaos. We received a phone call. She said that Sean had been airlifted to Albany Medical Center and um, that um, there had been a car crash and that uh, Sean, uh, she, she had seen Sean and he had uh, blood coming out of his nose. I had looked over at my, at, at them cutting my car open and they were taking my friend Mike out of the car as I was getting pushed into the police car. And the last thing I saw at the scene um, was him on the stretcher. And it's just his face was you know, covered in blood. If you're involved in a car crash, 
um, we don't know exactly what's wrong with you, especially if you're passed out or unconscious. And most people who have been drinking when they're in a car crash are probably going to be passed out when we find them. You may have injuries that might not show up right away because the alcohol can help mask those injuries. So we have to be extra careful in treating an alcohol victim. We're also not going to worry a lot about whether or not you're shy and you mind being uncovered or in your underwear or something like that. For us to see what's wrong, we're going to take off every bit of clothing you have on. We're going to put two very large needles on each side of your arm to help give you IV fluids. And we're going to put tubes in a lot of different places. When we got to the hospital, we rushed into the emergency room waiting area. There was a, a doctor and a nurse that came out of the uh, emergency room area. He asked me if I could describe Sean. And I said, yeah, he's, he's tall, he's a handsome boy. And he said, well, can, uh, can you tell me anything else about Sean? And he says to Kathy, do you have a photograph of Sean? And in her pocketbook, of course, she has a photograph. And, um, and then the doctor said, does he have any scars? And I'm thinking, not even a photograph is going to be good enough to identify Sean. What? about half the people who die in car crashes die from injuries to the brain and the spinal cord. He told us the news that no parent wants to hear. About seven minutes before we arrived, they had stopped trying to um, resuscitate him, and that his heart was the only thing that continued to work during all of that. But we weren't surprised because he was a runner, and he had a very strong heart. <laughs> When I found out, you know, that, that you know, they didn't make it, um, you know, it was a shock. I remember feeling sick to my stomach, um, and, and I think I even went to the bathroom and was, you know, vomited. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was just, just didn't seem real. People think that, oh, if I don't get killed, I'm going to be fine. Well, that's not really true. Mild head injuries can be very serious because the brain is so important to everything we do. I was rushed to the emergency room and responsive with seven major body injuries. My face was totally smashed in, the whole left side of my body was broken. And because the left side of my brain was smashed, the right side of my body was paralyzed. Very frequently in a car accident, uh, your head is the first thing that will either hit the windshield or the car door. And a lot of times with these victims, they have what we call traumatic brain injuries. But I, I vaguely remember coming out of the coma in this hospital and asking my father what happened. He said, I was in a car accident. I was like, what? And I was thinking back at my high school, and then they said, no, you go to VCU in Richmond. I was like, what? No, I couldn't believe it. And then they told me that the result of my accident was the girl dying. I didn't even know who this girl was. It's very important to understand that even if you don't have a horrible, horrible head injury, even if you have a mild head injury, that could change your personality. It could cause you to forget things quickly. It could cause you not to recognize your friends. It could cause you not to be able to do stuff that you used to do very well. I mean, you could have been a good guitar player. Get a head injury, you might never know how to put your fingers on the guitar and make music again. I remember I was really good at math, but now apparently um, um, I have the math of an eighth grader. When you're in a car that's moving at 60, 70, 80 miles an hour and you hit something, the car stops pretty quickly, but your body continues to move forward, especially if you're not wearing a seatbelt. The passenger in the front seat uh, had his seatbelt on and fortunately survived with only minor scratches. The other passenger was seated next to Sean in the back seat and like Sean was ejected from the car um, upon uh, the crash and he sustained uh, paralyzing injuries. His, his back, um, his spinal column was severed 
and uh, he's now a paraplegic. I tried going back to school and um, I went for like a year and a half and that didn't really work <laughs> and I don't know, I, I'm clueless as to what I'm going to do with my bed. When we got home from the emergency room we had to um, tell Sean's brother, Eric, uh, that his brother had been killed in a car crash. Well, the, the damage is exponential. It doesn't stay with one family or one person. It, it does move out, and it's sort of like throwing a, a stone into a pond, and it just keeps on going. Within an hour, um, everybody had poured into this house, into our house, and um, watching the whole community then in the next couple of hours be here, and all of his friends, all of Sean and Ian's friends, and just watching how how shocked and how disappointed and how hurt they were. Our whole town and school is in complete shock for forever because everyone felt invincible, you know. None of us, none of the kids at school ever felt like this could happen to them. And I think many of them sat there thinking, my God, this was, this was our friend just a couple days ago. We knew this, we knew him from track. He was on the track team. I ran cross country meets with him. He was with me um, at the prom and um, we worked together at a, at a restaurant and we used to go to the movies together. I miss just hanging out with him and his jokes and tracks different without him. It's less crazy, it's not as loud and um, I miss that a lot. I just miss seeing him all the time. The impact extends beyond the families of the victims who have been killed or forever paralyzed to the third passenger, the young man in the front seat, who may have escaped any physical injuries, but who knows how this is going to, what scars emotionally and mentally he has over this, but, but finally the fourth, the driver. That pain continues as well. Their family is affected, their personal life is affected, their emotions are always torn because they have taken someone's life. How pitiful he looked at the time that he was sentenced when he looked at us and, and told us that he was sorry and that he wished that he too could wake all of us up that this was a dream that he too wished that he could go back to that night when they all jumped in the car to just go a couple of miles the two days after I went to two wakes in one day and then the following day I went to two funerals in one morning back to back there's people looking at you. They know that the reason these funerals were going on was because of me. I was the culprit. You know, there was nowhere else to put the blame. I had two counts of second degree manslaughter um, with a motor vehicle, reckless driving, speeding, driving while intoxicated. You're talking about being incarcerated in jail behind bars for three, four, five, eight, 10 years of your life. I pled guilty to the charges. The judge took a recess, came back, uh, sentenced me to 10 years in prison, suspended after four, uh, five years probation, 1,000 hours community service, AA, random year analysis, no driving while on probation. Having a record, I'll always be a felon, no matter what, nothing can ever change that. Um, it's something I'm always going to have to explain on any job application, um, a school application. If I want to ask a girl out, you know, she's got to hear this, this story. What, you know, what's wrong with you? You're 26, you don't have a car, and you know, what kind of loser are you? You know that if you confront them, the reaction is most likely going to be negative. They're going to say to you, hey, look, I'm fine back off, I know what I'm doing. And at that point, what do you do? Here are the, the things that you should think about doing. Plan to stay where you are. Call a cab. It's not that hard to do. Call a friend who may be able to come out and assist you and bring you back to your home. Or have a pact with your family, with your mom and dad, and that pact will enable you to call them without any fear of repercussions and say, listen, I messed up. Can you please come and get me and bring me home? Lord, 
I would have re I would have loved to have received that phone call, and I wouldn't be sitting here then today talking to you if I if I had received that phone call. One of the most difficult situations that you can find yourself in is being sober yourself and watching a friend or a loved one who is intoxicated, impaired, about to get behind the wheel and drive. You need to then take another step and either try to convince them that this is a big mistake or make a strong effort to get the keys out of their hands and insist that they are not to get behind the wheel. A lot of kids don't feel like they're going to necessarily get in an accident. However, a lot of them, when they get in the car with people, do feel nervous or do think about the consequences. It's like putting a gun to your head and spinning the chamber with the one bullet. Is it going to happen to me? Am I going to be able to get home safe? It's just a mile down the road, and this guy looks like he can stand up, and it looks like he can drive. And you know what? I've known other people who've been able to drive drunk, and they got home safe. So why won't it happen to me? Those people are lucky. I got away with drinking and driving for three years. Every weekend, I would go out, and I would drink and drive, and I would get home all right that night. Um, and my time ran out. It's, it's not just that you got the license, and I'm just going to go do these things. No, you got the license, but you've got a big, big weight we've put on you. And that weight is the responsibility for the lives of everybody else that's around you. And it might sound stupid, but it's not. Like, you know, I thought it was stupid, but now this happens, and I'm like, that's not dumb. I don't want to lose another friend or... And I hope nobody, nobody who's watching this has to go through that, because I've seen people go through that, and it, it's very difficult, and it never, ever goes away. There's no reason to go out, ruin your prom, an event, a wedding, for a useless act of drinking and driving. It's all preventable. Think about what you're doing before you do it, because if you don't, things can get out of control, and all of a sudden, you're in a situation that you don't want to be in. Uh, just being punished, you know, having to live every day knowing what I did. Still to this day, I've been, you know, I think about him every day and I just think that it's something that could have been easily avoided. What will it take before young people decide that they're not going to let that happen to them and they're not going to let it happen to their parents and to their families and friends and that they have the control, that they can make the decision to be safe? Every day I think about it. You know, well, you know, all the what ifs, you know, if I had done something different, if I could go back, um, you know, and, and that'll, that'll, that's, that's forever. That's, that's, that's not going to change.